On this uh, 13th Sunday of the church year in ordinary time, 14 years ago, I preached my first sermon here at St. Odelia Parish. And two weeks later, the, my first sermon as pastor. And we now come to the last sermon as pastor. I have to admit I was a little disconcerted by the announcement in the bulletin that uh, it said the pastor will give his farewell homily at the 9 o'clock mass, after which the choir will sing praise God with great joy. <laughs> so my first sermon, how many remember what I said back then? Okay, not too many. One of the things I did was to answer a question I had been asked uh, uh, since my arrival here the 1st of June to work with the Croziers for about a month. What is your vision for this parish? And I said at that time that I imagine a parish as a community of disciples characterized by union of, of minds and hearts in the work that Jesus has given us to do. And I meant that we pray together, we work together, we learn together, we have fun together, we laugh together. And a parish re reminds us that we are something, uh, a part of something far larger than ourselves, a, a great community of saints. And some of our brothers and sisters in faith have already completed the earthly portion of their baptismal journey and rest in the divine presence. And the rest of us are on the road and charge in the meantime with the task of helping each other on that journey home. And so a parish means having companions on that road. A parish is a place, among others, where we learn together what makes for happiness in that world to come. Faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, picking up that cross together and walking behind the Lord up that road to Calvary, because many hands make any burden easier. In a parish, we can learn together that it is in giving life and love that we receive life and love here, and its abundance in the world to come, that we don't squander life and love when we lavish it on others as we die to self, but gain it back in abundance. Now, during the course of the nearly half a century now in uh, priestly ministry, I have had the opportunity to study many of the call narratives in the scriptures. And we, we might say that uh, scriptures give us a picture of a God who calls, who invites, and who does so with some very strange people. One of the earliest call narratives is found in the 17th chapter of Genesis, and there God appears to Abraham and tells him that he is to become a great nation, that God is about to establish a covenant with him that will do that. And Abraham hears the promise, he prostrates himself on the ground in front of the divine presence, and laughs and says to himself, can a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? Or can Sarah give birth at 90? And Abraham doesn't laugh alone. In the very next chapter, three divine visitors appear uh, to Abraham and repeat that divine promise. And this time Sarah overhears, and what does she do? She laughs. And then God says to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I bear a child old as I am? Is anything too marvelous for the Lord to do? And they do have a child. And they name the child Isaac. Yitzchak in Hebrew. What does it mean? What does Isaac mean? He laughs, right? He laughs. Who laughs? Well, every, every Hebrew name has a divine element attached to it, meaning God or, or Yahweh or one of the uh, particles for the divine. Yitzhak is a shortened form, but even shortened forms, even Hebrew names that are an abbreviation or a, a, a nickname, we might say, the divine element is to be understood. And so Isaac really means God laughed. So God had the last laugh after all. Is anything too marvelous for God to do? God began it all with two people as good as dead. As Abraham notes, is anything too marvelous for God to do? I started my, my priestly ministry at Immaculate Conception in Columbia Heights, and one of my classmates was from that parish. And we visited the parish one day and talked to the priest there. And after that visit, I said, 
I'm not going to come back to this parish. And my first assignment, Immaculate Conception Parish. And then after five years, and I have to admit I enjoyed it a lot there, after five years I was going to move on to another parish and more uh, uh, parish ministry. Uh, when I left the seminary, I said, I'm never coming back here again. And so my next assignment, the seminary, <laughs> for 20 years. And after 11 years, I was planning to leave the seminary to return to pastoral ministry again when a subtle invitation came. You know, why don't you apply for the job as rector who was retiring that year? And I did so and was accepted and spent another nine years at the seminary, the place where I said I was not going to return. But I enjoyed it immensely. I enjoyed being part of the important work of preparing the next generation of priests and pastors of the church, including your new pastor that will come next week, his first weekend here. And also the, the, the many lay students, the, the men and women engaged in pastoral ministry on whom we depend for our, our vibrant and, and active parishes. And I enjoy that, that immensely. My work here came about as a result of a misunderstanding of the assignment board. They thought I had applied, and I assured them that I had not, <laughs> and the subtle invitation. Well, would you consider applying? And of course I did, and here I am. I'm glad I did. It has been the 14 of the happiest years of my life, and I have had the honor and, and privilege and joy to work with, with so many dedicated people and, and parishioners. We couldn't have a parish of this size with all that we do without a dedicated staff of uh, talented uh, men and women, uh, including our, our music ministry, who, who are about to sing Praise God with great joy. You know, <laughs> uh, you know that I have received some, uh, some suggestions for my retirement, and I, I, I've learned that perhaps I shouldn't spend so much time formulating plans for the rest of my life uh, as so much as listening to perhaps what God has in store for me. It is said that if you want to make God laugh, tell him the plans for your life. So I received some suggestions uh, from the second graders here at St. Odelia Grade School, accompanied with, a, with some marvelous artwork as well. So here are some of the suggestions. One said, you should go surfing on the waves in Hawaii and just chill. <laughs> Another wrote, you should have more dance parties. <laughs> Second graders? Others, cook in the kitchen all the time. Walk a mile each day. Go on a cruise to the Bahamas. Take a ballet class. Hmm. I'm wondering how I'd look in a tutu. <laughs> Take more naps. More naps? And my favorite, relax and watch live stream mass on Sundays. <laughs> yeah, Isaac, God laughed. At least they all assumed that there was life after uh, retirement. Uh, in the past, when I've had to uh, go through leave-taking, I, I thought it, it was more in the, in the it, it felt more like a wake to me with a whole series of eulogies. And I've also, of course, now received uh, a list of advantages to my retiring at my advanced age. So, for example, one said, uh, relax, you know, kidnappers are not very interested in you. Or, in a hostage situation, you will be the first to be released. <laughs> or, people call you at 8.30 p.m. and say, did I wake you? <laughs> you enjoy hearing about other people's invasive medical procedures and enjoy talking about your own. You quit trying to hold your stomach in no matter who walks into the room. <laughs> and, lastly, your secrets are safe with your friends because they can't remember them either. <laughs> so, Yitzchak, God laughed. Besides laughter, there is one more important feature of our life together suggested by the gospel from Mark you just heard. 
After the woman is cured of her hemorrhage, Jesus then wants to know who touched him. And the disciples, of course, exasperated, said, you, you see the crowd around here and you want to know who touched you? As if to say, what in the world is wrong with you? But that question tells us something about Jesus, that physical touch is a, a part of his ministry, a, a part of his communicating, a part of his healing, a part of his preaching. And many people touched Jesus, and Jesus touched many people. Not only the, the woman with the hemorrhage in today's gospel, not only the 12-year-old daughter of Jairus, but also Peter's fevered mother-in-law, a blind man, a deaf man with a speech impediment, a, an epileptic boy, a, a woman bent over for 18 years, the high priest's slave whose ear Peter cut off, the, even the untouchable, even those suffering from Hansen's disease, leprosy then. He not only blessed children, but we're told took them in his arms. And at the Last Supper, he washed the feet of his disciples. Evidently, touch, physical contact, was important in the work that Jesus was doing. It was a sign of his love and his compassion, of his life of giving and communicating. And the touch of the body was simply a sign of a deeper touch, a touch of, of the mind and the heart and, and the soul. The need to touch and the need to be touched is one of the things that makes us human. Uh, we, we've learned through studies that uh, human babies do not thrive if they are deprived of all touch for the crucial first few months of life. We know that elderly live longer, and I've been much interested in those articles these days. <laughs> the elder live longer, the richer are their web of social relationships, having people to touch and to touch them and to being and to be able to reach out to touch others. And it's an important part of our religion as well. I, I mentioned that our, our sacramental system is based on that. Not only do we use natural substances, you know, water, bread, wine, oil, not only human words, but also touch. Each one of the sacraments involves the touch of one person to another, a touch that is really Jesus touching both of them because he, these are his actions continuing his work of making us holy down through the ages. And we believe that Jesus is present here among us in this Eucharistic assembly as we gathered in his name, that he is present within this whole community and in each one of us separately. And so when we reach out, say, for the sign of peace and touch each other, it is really Jesus touching us. And that touch enables us also to reach out in love to others who need us, need our life, need our love, and perhaps they also will respond, uh, as did that woman, uh, that she realized that it was Jesus who touched her. And perhaps they will realize that it was Christ in us who touched them. I often use the Apostle Paul to give us a description of, a, of, an, of an ideal parish, and he does this in practically every single one of his letters, and sometimes at great length. These are his words from the letter to the Romans. Regard others as more important than yourself. Work not half-heartedly, but with conscientiousness and an eager spirit. Be joyful in hope. Persevere in hardship. Keep praying regularly. Share with those in need and look for opportunities to be hospitable. Bless your persecutors. Give the same consideration to, al uh, to all alike. Pay no regard to social standing. Do not congratulate yourself on your own wisdom. Never pay back evil with evil. Live at peace with everyone. Never try to get revenge. That's a great description of any human community. It should be of every parish community. And let me end with the words of Paul as well. May God who complete the good work that he has begun in you. Because the, you know, the, the best days of St. Odelia are not behind us. They're in front of us, they're ahead of us, they're in the future. And so this is not really a goodbye for me so much as it, as it is something like Alfeder Zane, uh, until we meet again. And until that happens, may God hold you in the palm of his hand.
okay, I'll stay. 